Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Say, yes, I am. Happy 4th of July to everyone. Hey, let's sing this together. Have you been walking the same old road for miles and miles? Have you been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies? If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, well, there's a better life. Well, there's a better life. Come on, sing with me. If you've got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. Yes, he is. If you need freedom, a savior, he's a present shaking savior. If you got chains, well, he's a chain breaker. Well, we've all searched for the light. In the dead of night We've all found ourselves Worn out from the same old fight We've all run the things we know Just ain't right But there's a better life But there's a better life If you've got pain Well, he's a pain day this with me church if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it somebody testify come on if you believe it if you receive it if you can feel it somebody testify testify Trust. 
trust in Jesus. See Christ alone, cornerstone. Bye. 
Your grace is more The grace is found It's where you are Come on, let's see And where you are Lord, I am free Whoa. You guys may be seated. And so a week or two ago, I started reading this book. I decided I'm going to start reading more, which reading for me is very rare. But I decided I'm going to read this book, and it is titled Don't Waste Your Life. And, and I thought it would be a good book for me to start with because obviously I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to waste my time here on earth. And then the author, John Piper, is a very knowledgeable and insightful man. So, so I figured I'd give it a shot. In one, in one of the sections that I came across last week in this book, it talked about some of the sacrifices that Americans made during World War II. And so obviously I wasn't around during World War II. I know I look pretty old, but I'm not that old. Uh, but I wasn't around, and honestly, I don't know much about the lifestyle, how people were living, the sacrifices that had to be made during World War II. So I, I found this section in this book pretty insightful. So it says, during World War II, the entire nation seemed overnight to have snapped out of its Depression-era lethargy. 
Everyone scrambled to be of help. Rubber was needed for the war effort and gasoline and metal. A women's basketball game at Northwestern University was stopped so that the referee and all 10 players could scour the floor for a lost bobby pin. Americans pitched in to support strict rationing programs and their boys turned out as volunteers in various collection drives. Soon butter and milk were restricted along with canned goods and meat. Shoes became scarce in paper and silk. People grew victory gardens and drove at gas-saving victory speed of 35 miles an hour. Use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without became a popular slogan. Air raid sirens and blackouts were scrupulously obeyed. America sacrificed. And so that, that la last sentence of that section, America sacrificed, made a question for the church. And that question is, will the church sacrifice? Because as the church, as Christians as a whole, we are really good at being comfortable. Like we're really good at going through the motions of everyday life. Like we're really good at working our eight to five work jobs and, and doing that day after day after day. We're really comfortable of attending church on a Thursday night or a Sunday morning and that being our only interaction with our creator. And we're really comfortable with allowing plans, events, activities get in the way of furthering our relationship with God. But during this time of communion, we remember the greatest discomfort, the greatest sacrifice that was ever made for us, and that was Jesus giving his own life, dying on the cross for you and for me. And so as you walked in this morning, you should have been handed a cup containing the elements. And with this cup, you'll find a small piece of bread which represents Jesus' body and juice that represents Jesus' blood. See, Jesus, he was willing to die for us, and in return, we should be willing to live for him. We need to be seeking discomfort in our walks with Christ. And when I tell you to seek discomfort, I'm not telling you to find the most uncomfortable way to sit in your seat while you're at church, but I'm asking you to stretch yourself, to grow in your relationship with Christ. Whether that discomfort is sharing the good news with your friends, family, or coworkers, or whether it's stepping out of your comfort zone and picking up your Bible, even though you may not understand all of it, cho choosing a couple verses a day, a chapter a day, and growing in your knowledge of Christ. We as Christians are to seek discomfort, to make sacrifices, to be living sacrifices for Christ. And so as we go through this time of communion, may we remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for this morning and just the opportunity to gather as believers and to worship your great name. And I, God, I think for, sometimes we take it for granted, just the opportunity and the ability that we have to come to this facility and to worship you and to sit uh, peacefully, not, not really worrying about what's going to happen to us for being followers of you. And God, I believe that sometimes that comfort can lead to contentment in that we just go through the motions of being a Christian, that we aren't living sacrifices for you. And so God, I pray that as we remember your great sacrifice, that we in return give our lives fully to you, that we walk the walk and talk the talk and live fully for you. God, we love you and we praise you. And I praise your name, amen. I hope all of you uh, have one of these sermon notes sheets. If you don't, 
You can get up and get one in the back right now. You also can find it on the app. I really like filling in blanks during a sermon. It, it keeps me focused and also helps me know when the preacher is almost finished. <laughs> Being a Christian doesn't get you a pass from the problems in this life. Christians get cancer and have heart attacks. Christians face grief and sorrow. They have family problems, financial problems, relationship problems. Now, anyone who tells you otherwise is speaking from an empty head or a closed Bible. Jesus came to save us from sin, reconcile us to God, and give us every spiritual blessing. He promises glory in the next life, but trouble in this life. Look at what Jesus says in John 16, 33. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Years ago, Paul Stoltz wrote this book, Adversity Quotient, Turning Obstacles into Opportunities. He says almost all successful people in every field have one thing in common. They get back up when they get knocked down. They don't quit, they have a high adversity quotient. For example, Thomas Edison only attended grade school for just a few months and one of his teachers called him stupid. But he was a determined inventor. It took him 20 years and 50,000 experiments to invent a light, durable, efficient battery as an independent power supply. Someone said to Edison, you failed 50,000 times. What makes you think you will ever get results? He answered, results? I've gotten a lot of results. I know 50,000 things that won't work. Edison had a high AQ. And Stoltz says in the book, Edison shed some light on the meaning of persistence. I like that. Now, according to Stoltz, the good news is while you can't do much to improve your IQ, you can dramatically improve your AQ. You can improve your ability to face challenges. And Stoltz mentions faith as one of the key ingredients for your AQ. One of the best biblical examples of high AQ is the Old Testament character Joseph. He kept on even though people kept letting him down. Despite terrible problems, his trust in God is a reminder of what God can do with someone who has high AQ and a lot of faith. Here are some things I'd like for you to write down and remember about Joseph. Joseph's family let him down. Joseph's family let him down. Joseph grew up in a totally dysfunctional family. Now, a dysfunctional family is simply one not functioning as God intended. Divorce, lack of communication, sexual abuse, incest, sibling rivalry, greed, chemical addiction, extramarital affairs, child abuse, pornography, spouse abuse, and other evils contribute to a dysfunctional family. Here are some things that happened in Joseph's family. His mom died. His mom died. Joseph's mom, Rachel, his dad's favorite wife of four. Yes, you heard me right. I told you they were dysfunctional, didn't I? Joseph's mom, Rachel, died giving birth to her second child, Benjamin. Now, Joseph was just a kid when his mom died, and her death must have had a big impact on him. His dad spoiled him. Next blank on your notes. His dad spoiled him. Joseph was Jacob's favorite son, the firstborn son of Jacob's favorite wife. Now, Rachel, she was childless for years. So when Joseph came along in Jacob's old age, it was a double blessing. But instead of trying to cover his favoritism, Jacob showered Joseph with attention and gifts. He even gave him that famous coat of many colors, which made Joseph's brothers so angry. Now, 
even if you're the favorite kid in your family, like my brother, it's a disadvantage to grow up in a home where all the kids aren't equally loved. Next blank, his brothers abused him. His brothers abused him. Joseph's ten half-brothers were very jealous of him, and they were violent. Now, Joseph made the mistake of telling them about a dream he had where their bundles of grain bowed to his bundle of grain, and their stars bowed to his star. Genesis 37, verse 8. His brothers responded, So you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Now Jacob did not understand how much his boys hated Joseph, so he made a big mistake. He sent Joseph out to check on his brothers while they were tending sheep. Jacob shouldn't have played favorites. He shouldn't have put up with his son's jealousy. And he definitely should not have sent Joseph out alone to meet his brothers. Joseph's brothers abused him. Now you all probably know the story. They saw him coming and they said, this is our chance, let's get rid of him. So they attacked him, they ripped off that special coat, they beat him and they threw him into a dry cistern to die. When some traders came by, they sold their own brother into slavery. Joseph, at age 17, was taken away from everything he'd ever known and he became a slave. Maybe you were let down by family members. Maybe your parents spoiled you. Or maybe they were overly strict and you still have some scars. Maybe your relatives abused you physically, emotionally, sexually. And you still wrestle with memories, flashbacks, resentment. Maybe a spouse let you down by breaking marriage vows or lying to you. Maybe your kids disappointed you. As tough as those situations are, you don't have to quit. Regardless of your past, you can have a high AQ. Joseph is proof there's hope. Joseph was faithful to God even though his family let him down. When Joseph got to Egypt, he became the slave of Potiphar, the head of security for Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, Joseph didn't pout, refuse to work, wallow in resentment. No, he worked hard, deciding if he had to be a slave, he was going to be the best slave he could be. Here's the next thing to remember about Joseph. Joseph's boss let him down. Joseph's boss let him down. Genesis 39, verses 2 to 5. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. Well, life is getting better for Joseph. God is with him. He works hard. He's doing well. He gets promoted. But then, one day, a different kind of trouble it's Joseph. Genesis 39, 6 and 7. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. As a slave, Joseph couldn't totally avoid his master's wife, but he resisted the temptation. Genesis 39, 8 and 9. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. I want you to think for just a moment 
about what Joseph could have said if he was into the victim mindset of our world today. My brothers hated me. My dad spoiled me. My mom died when I was little. I've never been with a woman. I'm in a strange country all alone. My self-esteem has been awful since I became a slave. Everyone here does it anyway, so, so what does it matter? It'll be good for my career and keep me out of trouble. But Joseph didn't buy into any of that. He told himself and Potiphar's wife the truth. What she wanted him to do was evil and a sin against God. Joseph was faithful despite her advances, and he did his best to avoid her. But Mrs. Potiphar, she was persistent. Genesis 39, 10-12. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her. And he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. Potiphar's wife is going to make Joseph pay for turning her down and hurting her pride. Genesis 39, 16 to 20. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave you've brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. Potiphar was furious when... He heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. Potiphar sided with his wife. Joseph was completely loyal to his boss, but he still gets thrown in prison. So now Joseph is worse than a slave. He's a convict. But Joseph stayed faithful to God despite terrible treatment from his boss. Maybe you have been let down at work. Maybe you gave your life to the company and then one day the boss said, we appreciate you, but the company's been sold, your job is gone. Maybe your boss asked you to do something immoral or dishonest and then demoted you or fired you when you wouldn't do it. Maybe you worked hard for years, but then a relative of the boss or a relative of the owner was promoted ahead of you. Maybe a co-worker sabotaged you. Maybe you went into business with a friend, but your friend cheated you, took advantage of you, falsely accused you, ruined you. When those things happen, you can be devastated, bitter, or... You can have a high AQ. Even in prison, Joseph did well. Now, I think a lesser man would have quit, maybe thought about suicide. Even a good man would have just tolerated it, put in his time, hoped for something good to happen. But Joseph did his best, even in prison. Genesis 39, 21 to 23. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Two things helped Joseph in prison. First, God was with him. God blessed him. God showed him his faithful love. And second, Joseph wouldn't give up. Joseph kept believing, kept enduring, kept giving God opportunities to use him. Folks, God blesses effort. He asks us to go the extra mile, do our best, work hard, not get tired of doing good. Proverbs 13, verse 4. Lazy people want much, but get little. But those who work hard will prosper. Here's the next thing to remember about Joseph. Joseph's friends let him down. 
Joseph's friends let him down. Pharaoh got mad at his chief wine taster and chief baker, and he threw them both in prison. Joseph became friends with them because they were in the cell block he was managing. One morning, Joseph noticed both men were depressed, and he asked what was wrong. Genesis 40, 8 to 11. They replied, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. Interpreting dreams is God's business, Joseph replied. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream first. In my dream, he said, I saw a grapevine in front of me. The vine had three branches that began to bud and blossom, and soon it produced clusters of ripe grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand, so I took a cluster of grapes and squeezed the juice into the cup. Then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said, that's easy. In three days, Pharaoh will restore you to your position. You're out of here. You're back in the palace. But listen, when you get back to Pharaoh, remember me and get me out of this prison. Well, the baker was encouraged. He decided to tell Joseph his dream. Genesis 40, 16 and 17. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given the first dream such a positive interpretation, he said to Joseph, I had a dream too. In my dream, there were three baskets of white pastry stacked on my head. The top basket contained all kinds of pastries for Pharaoh, but the birds came and ate them from the basket on my head. Joseph says, is your insurance, your life insurance policy all paid up? Get your house in order in three days. Pharaoh's going to hang you on a tree and birds will eat your flesh. Well, it happened just as Joseph predicted. The baker was found guilty and executed. The wine taster was restored to his position. But Joseph's friend, the wine taster, the cupbearer, he let him down. Joseph's kindness was repaid with forgetfulness for two years the cupbearer completely forgot about Joseph. Folks, even friends who have every intention of helping you will let you down because they are human. Now, it may be something minor like forgetting to call you back or forgetting your birthday. It may be something major like betraying you or stealing your money or stealing your mate. That reminds me of that old country song, the the one that says, my wife ran off with my best friend and boy do I miss him. (laughs) Friends can let you down. Even Jesus was betrayed by Judas, a friend. Now, when a friend betrays you, it's devastating. You believed in him, you were loyal to him, you were convinced he'd be loyal to you. When a friend lets you down, you are tempted to just quit on everybody to protect yourself. But Joseph was faithful to God despite his friends letting him down. For two years he suffered but was faithful in prison. Genesis 41.1, two full years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. Well, Pharaoh starts looking for someone to interpret his dream, and the wine taster finally, finally remembers Joseph. He tells Pharaoh, two years ago, I had a dream in prison, and a guy named Joseph interpreted it perfectly. Joseph is brought from the prison to interpret Pharaoh's dream. The king is so impressed, he makes Joseph the number two man in all the land. Well, guess who now has Joseph as a boss, the wine taster. Joseph could have called him in and said, you let me suffer for two years in prison? What kind of friend are you? But there's no hint he held a grudge. I think after all Joseph went through, he probably wasn't surprised his friends let him down. Now, there are three lessons I want us to take home from Joseph. Three lessons that should help us hang on when people let us down. Fill in the next blanks, okay? All people are imperfect. Expect some disappointment. 
all people are imperfect, expect some disappointment. People aren't 100% good or 100% bad. Some are 98% good, others are 98% bad. Most are somewhere in between. Even the worst people have some good qualities. Even the best people are capable of sin. Lesson number two, have a high adversity quotient in your relationships. Have a high adversity quotient in your relationships. Keep forgiving people, trusting people, serving people, even if they let you down. Don't quit. Don't decide to never trust anyone again. Don't become a cynical, bitter, accusing person. <coughs> Joseph never let his disappointment in people destroy him. You might remember when his brothers came to Egypt looking for food, he was in charge. Well, they bowed down to him just as Joseph had predicted. And it was Joseph's chance to get even. But he didn't strike back. He forgave them and provided for them. Years ago, an anonymous writer wrote the Ten Commandments of Leadership. Now, I haven't always obeyed these, but I really like these. Number one, people are illogical, unreasonable, and self-centered. Love and trust them anyway. Number two, if you do good, people will accuse you of selfish, secret motives. Do good anyway. Number three, if you are successful, you will win false friends and true enemies. Succeed anyway. Number four, the service you render today will be forgotten tomorrow. Serve people anyway. Number five, honesty and frankness will make you vulnerable. Be honest and frank anyway. Number six, the biggest people with the biggest ideas can be shot down by the smallest people with the smallest ideas. Think big anyway. Number seven, people pretend to love the little people, but they sell their souls to the big people. Fight for the little people anyway. Number eight, what you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. Number nine, people really need help, but they may attack you if you do help. Help people anyway. And number 10, give the world the best you have, and you'll get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. Lesson number three on your notes about Joseph, put your total trust in God. Put your total trust in God. He's the only one worthy of complete trust. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. My favorite preacher, Bob Russell, still talks about a sermon he heard when he was in Christian college over 55 years ago. Here are the three main points of that sermon. First, trust yourself, but not too much. Second, trust other people, but not too much. Third, trust God and Him you can trust all the way. Trust God and Him you can trust all the way. It's what Joseph did. When, when people in situations let him down, he stuck with it. He didn't quit, and today we consider him one of the heroes of the faith because he didn't give up. Trust God, and him you can trust all the way. It's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't give up. His family let him down. Even his own brothers didn't believe in him. His friends betrayed him and left him. The people he came to save killed him, but he never quit. He never gave up, and we are to do the same. Hebrews 12, 1 to 3. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. 
Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray we would never forget your great faithfulness to us. Help us be faithful. I pray there'd be a staying power, a dependability, a reliability in us that pleases you and influences other people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing back. I've stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken. It'll be all right, but right now, oh, right now, I just can't. It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down. But what will I say when I'm held to the flame? Like I am right now I know you're able and I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you They say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. A good thing, a little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmoved. to be able to see it is where
Just want to tell you a few things before you head out today. The first being, in my community meditation, I talked about offering, uh, about sacrifice, sorry. And sometimes offering can feel like a sacrifice, but I like to think of it as an eternal investment, investing into the church to further the gospel, investing into our kids and youth programming, and investing into our missionary partners who are doing awesome things all across the world. And you can give by visiting our website, 1c.church, or you can drop your tithes and offerings in the giving walls on your way out from service. The next thing is a little save the day. Coming up on August 8th, we're going to be having our 1C back to school bashing. So there's going to be plenty more information to come in the coming weeks, but we just wanted to let you guys know about that so you can get it on your calendar. That's going to be on August 8th. And then lastly, if this is your first time here, we are so glad that you guys have decided to join us for worship. And if you're new, we'd ask you to text the number that we're going to throw up on the screen. And that's going to send you a link to a connections card. We ask you to fill that out. Or if you're here in person, go out to our Next Steps area and fill one out there. And for every first-time guest, we donate $5 to Humble Horizons. So happy 4th of July. Have a great and safe rest of your day.